has to be adjusted properly. Good morning, everybody. You all are the very picture of health, and the room sounds wonderful. <laughs> Thankful to be here with you, though. Um, for those of us that were out this last week, that, that the Lord gave us a safe trip, and that we're able to come back and um, once again focus on God's Word. I hope today's subject will be of great benefit to you, um, and as we work our way through it, you'll be blessed and challenged by the Scriptures. If you would, please take your Bibles, and we'll open them to the 20th chapter of this book, Revelation chapter 20, looking at verses 7 through 10. I'll remind you as you're turning there, we're in the final part of the inspired outline that was given to us all the way back in chapter 1. John was told to write down the things which shall be hereafter. That's what we're dealing with today. And as we mentioned, the largest part of that futuristic section was taken up by the tribulation period, which we've finished now, chapter 6 through 19. Now we've moved past that. We're dealing with what's going to take place after the return of Christ. In other words, once Jesus comes back to the earth at the end of the seven years, what does the book of Revelation say will happen? And we've said four different specific things. We're talking about the kingdom, the establishment of his kingdom, the great white throne judgment, with which we'll be dealing with next week, the destruction of the present heavens and earth, and then the creation of a new heavens and a new earth. Some pretty amazing stuff to look forward to. So in chapter 20, we are still in the first of those four major events. We're dealing with the establishment of Christ's kingdom on the earth. And we ought to be very interested in what the Bible says about it, because if you are saved, then this is your future. How did Jesus teach us to pray? He said to say, thy kingdom come. When the kingdom arrives, he's answering that prayer request. So this transfer of authority discussed in chapter 20 has three parts to it. We've talked about a massive chain and how Satan will be bound in prison for a literal thousand year period. The next part of that passage speaks of the saints reigning with Christ, resurrected and ruling alongside the Lord for again a literal thousand years. Can you imagine that? If you're Christ's, this is your future. This is my future and it really puts our petty little difficulties in this life in some good perspective. So we talked about a chain and a reign and this morning in verses 7 through 10, we find out what happens at the end of that thousand years. It's a tragic but very needful lesson for all to hear and all to meditate on. We might, what, we might call what is described in verses 7 through 10 the Great Revolt. And you could ask, why is he spending all this time on just four verses? Is this really all that relevant to us? In answer to that, I'd remind you of what we'll see next week. Verses 11 through 15 describe the final judgment of the wicked called the Great White Throne Judgment. The end of the chapter addresses the what part of all of this, but the passage that we will deal with today answers the question of why regarding this judgment. Why the finality? Why the severity? Why does God deal with the lost in this manner? The second half of this chapter confronts a false philosophy and a doctrine that's actually very popular in the world today. It's the humanistic idea that man, if given the right opportunities or placed in the right environment, will flourish without the intervention of God. We learned a couple weeks ago that God has a purpose for imprisoning Satan in the bottomless pit. This morning we'll discover that purpose. What is the Lord going to teach humanity in the future, and really what is he trying to show us right now? Now I'm sure you've made it to your text. We'll read it in a moment. We're going to divide the passage into four parts. Number one, we have the adversary in verse 7. Next, we have the apostasy in verse 8. Third, the attack in verse 9. And finally, the destruction of Satan, which is the end of verse 9 on into verse 10. So let's read that together, starting in verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, encompassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven, and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, um, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. If you're just joining us, we're in Revelation chapter 20, and we just read verses 7 through 10. 
So the first thing we have here is some information about the adversary. That's our first point. Satan, that old serpent, he's let out one more time. The phrase are expired comes from one Greek word, telio, meaning finished or fulfilled. When God, when the time God has allotted is fulfilled, the devil will be released and not a moment before. This is entirely on the Lord's timetable. We've seen that during this time, Satan is actually in a different location than his two evil compatriots, the beast and the false prophet. You'll remember that when Jesus returns, one of the first things he's going to do is throw those two straight into the lake of fire. As payment for all of their sins and blasphemies, they actually get to be the very first inhabitants of this horrible place. When you see this, you would kind of think the devil will be joining them, but instead he's actually separated from them and put into the bottomless pit. In verse 7, we discover that after a thousand years, God has not forgotten about him. And we wonder why is he mentioned again? Because God has one more purpose for the devil to fulfill. It's encouraging to look at how history is portrayed in the Bible. We can realize that though Satan is a very powerful adversary, and though he rules this world, he only exists by the will of God. In fact, God is so in control that even his arch enemy and his rebellion only ends up accomplishing the Lord's purposes. I say this to give you an important reminder about different trials and circumstances. Don't let them shake you. You should never get the impression that somehow God has lost control of your life or control of what is going on. The chaos and the trouble are actually an opportunity to display the confidence and stability that the Lord has brought into your life. Things can be very severe, but we must see that they are only there because God has a purpose. So number one, the adversary, Satan, is going to be released. Number two, what is the immediate result of his newfound freedom? He sure doesn't waste any time, does he? Verse 8 highlights the apostasy that will appear because of his influence. Notice what verse 8 says, speaking of the devil. And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Now, those of you with gainful employment understand what a job description is, don't you? Well, here is Satan's job description. We see that he primarily spends his time deceiving the nations. And you'll also notice the fact that you can't rehabilitate evil. 1,000 years later, and Satan's character has not changed one iota. You'd think a 1,000 years in solitary confinement would cause him to rethink a few things. But he doesn't. He comes out of prison with the same violent hatred for God that he has had since the moment he fell. It doesn't matter where he's located. That's just what Satan is. Recognize that God is permitting some of this to happen for the express purpose of proving his justice God is acting righteously when he does away with the devil and all wicked men forever. Jesus, when he spoke of Satan, said this in John 8, 44. He said, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father will, ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Christ says there is no truth in him. There's no redemption. There's no rehabilitation for Satan. His nature has never changed, and it won't change even after a thousand years in the pit. So Satan slithers his way out, and it says that he immediately starts making allies. Have you ever underestimated the deceptive power of Satan? I mean, we're not given a clear timeline in this text, but the impression that I get is that his deception does not take a very long time. Satan has incredible deceptive power. In fact, we read about this in Revelation 12, 9. It says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. It doesn't just say he deceives the world. He deceiveth the whole world. And what we're witnessing here is probably one of the greatest examples of this deceptive power because now he's going to deceive a world that's been living in the presence of the Lord for a thousand years. The people we're reading about here have nothing to complain about. They've been living in a perfect environment for a full thousand years, and yet Satan is still able to control them. We continue on there in verse 8, and it talks about these rebels. Notice what it says here, which are in the four quarters of the earth. And so from the perspective of John, it seems like this rebellion is worldwide. It's international in scope. Now the apostle goes on to depict this uprising as something called Gog and Magog. 
Now, people get really confused about these two terms. And if you look around, there's a lot of speculation about what he's talking about. Just for a little historical context, both Gog and Magog, they were real individuals in the Old Testament. Gog was the son of Shemaiah, and Magog was the son of Japheth. In Ezekiel 38, Gog is spoken of as being the prince of places called Meshach, Tubal, and the land of Magog. When people see Gog and Magog here in Revelation, they automatically link it to Ezekiel 38 and 39, which is actually describing an end-time invasion of the nation of Israel. And so people think that this is talking about the same war, but it's not. There are some significant differences between Revelation 20 and Ezekiel 38 and 39. The invasion in Ezekiel comes from the north. That's not what happens here. All nations are going to be involved in this final rebellion. Ezekiel also names nine key players like Tubal, Meshach, Rosh, and Persia. No nations whatsoever are mentioned in Revelation. The Gog-Magog invasion of Ezekiel leads to the Millennial Kingdom that's described in chapter 40 through 48. But that's not what's taking place here. This battle does not lead to the Millennial Kingdom. In fact, the Millennial Kingdom is over by the time this battle takes place. Instead, this final conflict paves the way to the eternal state. So don't conflate, what I'm getting at is don't conflate the two battles just because you see the words Gog and Magog. That title is used to describe the same rebellion that comes out we see in Ezekiel. It's the same idea, the same concept. We continue on and the text says that Satan's objective is to gather the people together for battle. Now probably one of the most fascinating parts in all of this to me is the number, the sheer quantity of people that respond to this deception. John, when he sees this, writes the number of whom, that's talking about the rebels, is as the sand of the sea, an almost unfathomable army of people. That's the group here at the end that decides to throw in their lot with Satan. Now, the question might pop into your mind at the point, this point. If the righteous are resurrected and are ruling and reigning alongside Christ, then where did all of these rebels come from? How at the end of 1,000 years are there still enough lost people in the world to be compared to the sand of the sea? We can find that answer to, the answer to that question actually in Matthew 24, 22, where Jesus says, speaking of the tribulation, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, these days should be shortened. You see, God will not permit the tribulation to last longer than seven years because if he did, the world's population obviously would be completely wiped out. There has to be some survivors. There actually needs to be a Jewish remnant left so God can fulfill his covenant with them. So quite clearly, there are going to be some people that survive the great tribulation. <coughs> now, if you are saved today, don't think that this is talking about you. All of the saved will be raptured before the tribulation period starts. You will be in your resurrected and glorified body at this point. But there will also be a lot of people that are saved during the tribulation. We've talked about them already. Many will be killed by persecution, but some are going to survive and they will make it all the way to the very end. And so there will be some that enter into this millennial kingdom still in their mortal bodies. The Bible indicates that during this time, the human lifespan is actually going to be greatly extended. It even talks about someone that will die at 100 years old. People will look at that person and say, wow, that's unusual. They didn't live very long. These people are going to have children, and their children are going to have children. During the thousand-year reign, the earth will be repopulated. But though the presence of Christ will change the earth drastically, there's going to be something that remains, and that is the sin nature. This sin nature will be passed from those that survived the tribulation into their children and into their grandchildren. It's like back at the time of the flood, remember? God cleansed the earth of all evil, but the eight people in the ark, they still had a sin nature. They gave this sin nature to their children and look at the world today. There was a flood, but now the earth has been completely repopulated, and guess what? It's again filled with wickedness. This is exactly how it will work during the millennial reign. That's why there will be great evangelism taking place during this time. The difference is that Christ's rule and Satan's imprisonment is going to greatly restrain evil, at least externally. 
You might think that this sounds a little like science fiction, but there's going to be a period of time on this planet when resurrected and non-resurrected people are going to be interacting with one another. Don't think that this is strange. Think about it. It's already happened in history. In between Christ's resurrection and ascension, there was a period of 40 days. Jesus was in his resurrected body, and he's with his disciples who are still in their non-resurrected bodies. They're touching him, they're enjoying meals together, and he's teaching them about the kingdom of God. The same scenario. All we have here in Revelation is this biblical precedent is now continuing for a thousand years. So look at what's happening here. This is where we see the main point of these verses in this whole chapter. What lesson is God teaching by releasing Satan one last time? And it's very interesting that when it talks about the final rebellion, it's not the resurrected people that are rebelling. They can't. They have no sin nature. It's talking about the people that have inherited a sin nature from your parents. Keep in mind that all of these people have been living in what I would think would be nearly a perfect environment. They're not bothered by starvation, hunger, or disease. Prosperity has broken out all over the earth. In fact, the Bible says during that time, the nations will forget what war is. Instead, they will sow and reap. A little child will be able to put their hand on a venomous snake and not be bitten. Every conceivable need that people might have is satisfied. And so maybe you'd naturally think that the folks that are living on the earth during this time would praise the Lord and happily submit to his will. But that's not what they do, is it? Instead, they rebel at the very first opportunity. And we ask ourselves, what is this all about? Why would God allow this to happen? He allowed, has allowed some to survive the tribulation period. He's allowed the earth to be repopulated. He's bound Satan for 1,000 years before releasing him one last time. What is the lesson in this? Well, if you listen to the talking heads and those that are influential in our society, where do they think that evil comes from? You've heard what they preach. If we could only eliminate hunger, if we could give people a better education, if folks had equal opportunities, if there was no racial inequality, and on and on and on they go. Please pay close attention to the news coverage following a mass killing or a school shooting. Most are willing to acknowledge that the person that did the evil, did the deed was evil. But they are also very quick to run through a whole list of possible causes that have nothing to do with that person. They give a bunch of external reasons for why they may have pulled the trigger. The assumption is that such a person would have acted differently if only they'd been given different opportunities. Or if only they'd experienced a different environment. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're here today and your whole life has been spent feeling as though you would excel under ideal conditions, I'm here to tell you the problem is not floating out there in the void somewhere. It's right here. The lesson in this text forces us to stop pointing our fingers at everyone and everything else and instead to point them right back at where the real issue lies. What does our Bible tell us? Evil comes from the heart. The Bible answers the age-old question, why do we act the way we act? Why do we do the things we do? You're not going to find this diagnosis in the thinking of modern-day Christian psychology or secular humanism or the justice system or politics, but you will find it everywhere in God's Word. The Bible says that we behave the way we do because we are corrupt on the inside to the core. Genesis 8.21 says the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. In fact, according to Psalm 51.5, you inherited a sin nature at the point of conception. All of us can say right along with David, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Why can't your kids, why can't people in this world just get along? The book of James tells us, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, ye fight and war. James says, if you want to know where the problem is, you better look in the mirror. You're the problem, and the reason we have this problem is because we have a corrupt nature. What is the one thing you don't have to teach your kids? We don't have to take our little ones aside and say, okay, gather around. We're going to have a lesson today on how to be selfish. We don't say, I'm going to teach you how to get angry when you don't get your way. Here's how you do it. Well, some of us do teach them that. The sad reality is they already know how to do it. They're actually experts in it. 
just like you and I are already know how to sin because sin comes natural to us. And no amount of throwing money at the problem or cleaning up the environment or providing universal health care or limiting structural bias or whatever other nonsense people are talking about today, no amount of external measures can fix an internal problem. This is what makes the gospel fundamentally different from every other message. False religion teaches men how to fix the outside. The inside or outside was fixed at the flood, but the sin nature was still there. The outside is restrained through the kingdom, but the sin nature is still there. You see, folks, here's the reality of the situation. There's something that we need more than anything else, and most of the time people are completely blind to it. We need our insides fixed. And that is the essence of true biblical Christianity. This is why Jesus, when he spoke to Nicodemus in John 3, 3 through 5, said, unless one is born again, a radical internal change, he cannot see or enter the kingdom of God. Because it's not about the environment. It's not about your opportunities or your equality. It's about being given an entirely new nature. A nature that is completely foreign and alien to this one. 2 Peter 1, 4 says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Partaking of the divine nature is not about self-reformation or quitting some sin or sins. It's not about adding a special boost of spiritual willpower to your life. It's about being transformed in the blink of an eye by the power of God. It's about being given a new heart that is now capable of being sanctified. If you've got that, if you've been converted, then you have a change that the Bible can actually work with. If you don't have that in a person, if you have something else, something less than that, and you're applying all this environmental stuff over and over again, you might be fixing one problem after another, but you're not really solving anything. If you've ever found yourself pounding your, wall, your head against the wall with someone that just will not be sanctified, you probably have your answer. Now, God could just have come out and told us that, couldn't he? Isn't there an easier way to express this? Well, the truth is he has told us this countless times in his word. But men ignore what he says because we don't really believe it. We don't really think we're all that bad. I mean, are we really this messed up? And so God in his grace says, all right, go ahead and live in a world with no war, no racism, no bias, no hole in the ozone layer, no deficiencies in the healthcare system. Whatever it is that people are all up in arms about today, here's your perfect world. And yet a thousand years later, what do people do when they're given the chance? They still act like people. You say, but wait, didn't Satan cause this? After all, he is the one deceiving the nations. The answer is no, Satan didn't cause this. By the way, Satan doesn't cause you to sin today. He gives people by his deception an opportunity to express what already exists inside of them. Zechariah 14, 16 through 18, speaking of the men during the millennial reign, actually describes those that will not want to go to Jerusalem to worship Jesus Christ. And the consequences of their rebellion during that time will be terrible drought. And so they eventually, grudgingly go. You see, the hatred of God is still there inside the inhabitants of the kingdom. They just hide it to a large degree because Jesus is ruling with a rod of iron. To reveal what is really going on in the hearts of men, God lets Satan out one last time. That's why he does it. All the devil does is give people a chance to express what they already want to do. I appreciate this quote I found on the subject. It says, God demonstrates by this one final event that even under the best conditions, mankind's problem is the heart. If a person doesn't understand this, they don't really understand Christianity at all. This is one of the most fundamental principles of the faith, but men still miss it by droves. There are people in this auditorium right now that don't understand this. Oh, you might intellectually believe you are a sinner to some degree. Every child raised in a Baptist church knows that. But the true weight of who and what you are without Christ has never dawned on your mind. If it had, you would be fleeing to his mercy as fast as you could possibly go. Mark 7, 20-23 makes this concept clear. Jesus said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man, 
or from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. It's not about what you take into your body. The issue isn't what you consume. The issue is what you produce. The issue is your condition in Adam. And so you begin to see this here in Revelation. You begin to understand what this means. God is teaching us that even under the best conditions, mankind's problem is the heart. Now, before we conclude this message by finishing up verses 9 through 10, what other applications can we make? Is there something to be learned here by those that are saved, that are converted? We see that circumstances have nothing to do with the true condition of the heart. And so what stands out clearly to me is a similar lesson that I can take from this. Am I a person that to any degree that is waiting on the right circumstances to be faithful or to be obedient to God? Am I thinking something like, if only I wasn't so busy, or if only my home life wasn't so unstable, if only I had more opportunities, I would be able to be faithful in this. I hope you see just how easy it is to fall into exactly the same type of thinking that's exposed by this passage. If I had more time, I would read my Bible more. If I didn't have to deal with so much stress, I'd be doing this or that for the Lord. If people were more interested in what I had to say, I would be sharing the gospel more. I hope I'm not the only one that has to fight these kinds of thoughts. It might make for an easy justification, but it's still it's just a lie that we tell ourselves. The truth is that as our lives get easier and as the speed bumps and trials smooth out, we will actually find less time to be engaged in what God wants us to do. We fill our time with many other things. As opposition to the truth lessens, we don't become braver people. We actually become less courageous. I mean, if I take the time and I think about some of the circumstances in this life that have prevented me from being faithful to God, frankly, I'm just ashamed. I can only speak for myself when I say that, honestly, the problem has never really been the circumstances. The issue has never been the environment. The problem, as we've seen so clearly here, has always come back to me. I have been the one distracted. I have been the one cowardly. I have been lazy. I have been unfaithful. Whatever the issue is, it has always come back to me. And so I say that not to call you out, but to prompt you to think about this lesson. To whatever degree we believe that our own faithfulness or obedience depends on something external, is to what degree we need to get our thinking back in line with the Word of God. Nothing about the Christian life is dependent on circumstances. Praise God. So please don't wait on them to do what needs to be done. Now, we've seen the results of Satan's release. The rebellion that has been lurking in the hearts of men this entire time is on full display. This rebellion culminates in the attack that we find in verse 9. It says, And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Now, what city do you think this would be? This is the city of Jerusalem. You say, well, it doesn't say Jerusalem here. No, it doesn't. But if you read Psalm 78, 68, and 87, 2, you'll see that Zion, a synonym for Jerusalem in the Bible, is called the Mount Zion, which he loved. It's, it's God's beloved city. Why would Satan lead this revolt against Jerusalem? Well, for the simple reason that this is the city that is the center of Christ's government. Jerusalem is this world's headquarters for this kingdom for a thousand years. Isaiah 2, 3 says, And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. It's talking about this time in history. I hope you're able to see this. Israel has been despised by the nations for thousands of years, but we're headed for a kingdom where Israel is taking center stage. Jesus is not running things from Washington, D.C. or London or Tokyo. He's running things from the city of Jerusalem. Satan knows it, and so his final resistance is he goes after it. And then comes the annihilation of Satan. We have fire consuming Satan's henchmen from heaven, and then Satan himself, verse 10, will be consumed by the fires of hell. What does it say? <laughs> Some of the best words in your whole Bible. 
and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Hallelujah. This is quite striking, isn't it? Does anyone see a battle happening here? I mean, we have this worldwide revolt against God, and yet God just destroys the enemies instantly. It's kind of like what we saw in Revelation 19, where the armies of the beast and the false prophet appeared to oppose the rider on the white horse, and yet Jesus just says the word and the battle is done. The fire comes down from heaven and the battle, if we can even call it that, and I'm not sure we can, it's over. Maybe we should reframe the things that God allows into our own lives and view them properly. Can he take them away in an instant? Can he destroy this gigantic army in a moment? Yeah, he can. Therefore, challenges that exist in your life must be there for a reason, to teach us how to be faithful even under adverse circumstances. After this, we see the moment that Satan himself is consumed in the lake of fire. Verse 10 says, The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Here's the end for Satan. He's been defeated progressively throughout the Bible. He was just bound for a thousand years, and at the end of the millennial kingdom, he's thrown into the lake of fire. You never hear from Satan again after this. It's finally over. This is the final fulfillment of what God said all the way back at Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. There's something coming that's going to take your head, Satan, and it's going to crush it where you won't be able to recover. And that's what we're seeing right here in Revelation 20.10. So are you going through your life depressed or overwhelmed by circumstances? Or are you going through your life with courage and optimism? Because Romans 16.20 says, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Do you believe that? The being that causes Christians the most grief is the very being that is destined very soon to be crushed. And he goes into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are also. Yeah, they're still in there. A thousand years have passed. They're in there because, folks, hell is forever. You don't disappear. You don't explode. You continue on under the wrath of God. Verse 10 is very clear. It says, they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. You say, well, what does tormented mean? It means what it means, tormented. You say, well, what does forever and ever mean? That's what it means, forever and ever. Revelation 14, 11 says, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. That's what awaits Satan and the unholy trinity. What do we need to take from these four verses? Well, a number of things. If this is really the fate of every lost person, and we'll see much more on that next week, what should we be busy doing? Taking the gospel to them. Amen. Presentation of the gospel here is very simple, isn't it? Because we don't want people to go into this place. I mean, wouldn't it be tragic to hear all of this teaching here at church and yet leave here without Christ and die today? That fate can only be reversed by reaching out for God's cure because God has given us one. He certainly described the problem. We see it very clearly here, but he's also given us the solution. The cure is his son who paid the penalty for your sin 2,000 years ago through his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. His final words on the cross were, it is finished, and he was talking about you. We've seen very clearly in this passage that the real problem doesn't lie outside of us. The real problem is us. How could I trust myself when my flesh is so fallen? I trust in what he did for me, and not only does he bridge the gap between me and the holiness of God, not only does he change my eternal destiny so I will not share Satan's fate, but he gives me something else. He fixes me on the inside through the spiritual birth and the presence of the new nature. Jesus was asked, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? He responded, this is the work of God, that ye believe on him who he hath sent. So for anyone that is not yet trusted in Christ, I would urge you to do so this morning. Next week, we'll be focused on the consequences of refusing to believe. There are more if you can believe that.
And for anyone that is saved, but that has in some way been thinking wrongly about being faithful, or that has been allowing circumstances and the environment to prevent spiritual growth, may we all recognize that part of having the new nature means that we can be as faithful as we choose to be. We have the liberty to do that. And just like with those living during the millennial reign, the responsibility at the end of the day lies with us. Let's pray.